All right, we have these five brain regions. Who cares? What does it mean? All right. The fact that we can pinpoint in the brain what might be giving rise to these symptoms, does that help us understand this disorder any better? Or does it just make us feel better because we can point to biology rather than sociology as the cause of ADHD? Well, let me explain why if you understand what these networks do, you can start to understand ADHD a heck of a lot better. And one of the foremost ideas that people need to understand, and it's displayed beautifully here in this particular paper, this is the organization of the cortex. And what you see here is a front to back, rostral to caudal, top down organization of the brain, which means that our thoughts, our highest plans are located up here, and then these will be translated into smaller behavioral structures back in here. These will then be translated into the secondary motor zone and become the actions and gestures we actually execute. And those will project right on to the primary motor zone, which is located right in here, to actually create the muscle movements for that behavior. There is a top-down, front-to-back, rostral-caudal organization of the frontal cortex. The higher the level of thinking and planning, the more forward that is being done. The more molecular aspects of behavior, the sequences we will string together, are occurring further back. And the further back you go, the more minute and molecular the behavioral structures become. The further forward you go, the more hierarchically organized behavior becomes. We can see that here in a behavioral structure. This is taking money, going to the bank, and depositing the money in a safe deposit box. That is a higher order structure of behavior. But it can be broken down into the sequence you see on the left, and especially into two different structures of behavior that involve picking up the money and putting it in the box, and involve the actual opening and closing of the, excuse me, of the locked box itself, two separate overlapping hierarchies. And they are hierarchies because you can see here that we can split them, excuse me, for some reason. We can see here that we can split them into their two behavioral sequences nested under the larger purpose, the goal. What are we trying to do? Then we translate it into its sub-goals. We translate those sub-goals into much smaller behavioral structures and we execute those in a sequence. So this ability to go from higher level to lower level behavior and to sequence it properly is a function of the prefrontal lobe. This is why we have it. This is what it does. If you want to think of something even bigger, plan a wedding. <laughs> Break that one down into its substructures and then it's to its nested even more molecular activities, all the way down to picking up the phone, calling the minister, then lining up the florist, then lining up the church, then lining up the invitations and the printer, and so on. And underneath each of those is going to be a whole series of even smaller actions and gestures, all building toward the culmination of a future goal. If you understand that, you now know why you have a frontal lobe. <clears throat> It's also illustrated here, I'm not going to spend much time on it because we've already discussed it, but the higher goals are retained at the foremost part of the frontal lobe. They will then be translated into their substructures, and those are translated in even further back as we move into the more minute actions that we do. What does this mean for ADHD? It means you cannot organize behavior as well as other people into these larger, hierarchically organized and temporally sequenced structures. Individuals with ADHD will find themselves able to engage in a couple of the minor sequences, but the structure is lost, the goal is shattered, the behavior is not fully executed, and the goal is either not attained or poorly attained. Because one cannot organize, one cannot glue together all of these substructures to attain these higher level functions. And this is where you get your short attention span. The short attention span is simply the fact that you can engage in these smaller structures, 
but you can't organize them into those larger and larger goals and be able to protect it and sustain it and carry it forward until the goal is done. So understanding the neuroanatomy of ADHD helps us to understand the behavioral symptoms of ADHD and this inability to hierarchically organize long chains of behavior to accomplish our goals. We can now define ADHD as a disorder of persistence toward the future, which is also deeply affected by a, res a failure to resist distraction. The individual cannot help responding to irrelevant events that lie outside of these behavioral structures, and the structure falls apart. Because the moment you are trying to engage the sequence, something else irrelevant happens, and you are responding to that. And the goal is lost, the sequence fails, and now you've only done part of the task and failed to engage the entire task. So we can now say that this is not an attention disorder. This is a problem with persistence toward the future, with the ability to hierarchically organize behavior into ever larger structures to accomplish the principal goals of our lives, the important things that lie ahead in the future in time. That instead, you will have marked difficulties resisting distractions, and that will shatter this working memory function as we've described it, this hierarchy of behavior, and now you are skipping from one incompleted sequence to another, hence the short attention span and the marked distractibility. And even when distracted, the patient with ADHD is going to find it very difficult to re-engage the uncompleted task or goal because they can't hold all of this in mind anymore. Once the distraction occurs, working memory, which is up here, is shattered, the goal is lost, and the person is off to the races. Whatever else happens in the moment will be more compelling than the goal they had held in mind. So patients with ADHD will not re-engage incompleted activities the way other people would have done had they been interrupted and had to deal with a compelling distraction. Other people get back to work, finish the task, see the goal to its final completion. The patient with ADHD is far less likely to do so. Now that is a function of working memory, as I have said, which suggests that ADHD is not an attention disorder. It's a disorder of at least working memory. And since working memory, as we will show, is one of the major executive abilities, it implies that the other executive abilities must be at risk also, which therefore means that ADHD, especially in adults, is an executive function disorder, not an attention deficit disorder. Now, DSM-5 will not change the name no matter how much you plead with them, even though we know that ADHD is a misnomer. And we know that it trivializes these profound impairments in these relatively unique human abilities. And the reason we will not do so is for a very good reason. The term ADHD now appears in both of our countries in laws, regulations, entitlements, and protections, especially in the United States. And if you rename a disorder, you have just disenfranchised these individuals from those hard-won protections and entitlements. So we won't rename the disorder, if only because of legal political reasons, even though the science is telling us that the name is inappropriate, if not trivial. In fact, I think that the name is part of our problem in convincing the public that there is a real disorder here, because attention deficit really does sound rather banal, doesn't it? I mean, just go to Starbucks, have a coffee, get some caffeine, would you? We got serious disorders to contend with. I mean, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, major depression. Now, those sound impressive. But ADHD, pff, get out of here, you know? We got serious mental disorders to deal with. But if you were to rephrase ADHD as executive function deficit disorder, and if you know that the executive system exists to organize behavior across time, to allow you to self-regulate toward that future. You could call ADHD either EFDD or SRDD, self-regulation deficit disorder. Now that's an impressive name because it speaks to something uniquely human, and that is self-regulation. 
So you need to know that regardless of what DSM-5 does with the name, and it will not change it, I can assure you of that, that we as patients, as clinicians, as family members need to understand that we have changed the nature of this disorder, that we now have a much better insight into what's going wrong, and it ain't attention. It's executive functioning.